Good to see you, and good morning to you. Sorry, I'm a minute late. Um, I got a cat trapped in the door. This one, she followed me in. I didn't hear it, and then she, the door has like an auto shutter, and she was like stuck in it. She seems, she seems to be in one piece. Uh, so, a uh, bit of bit of minor drama there, but she seems all right. That's the main thing. Now, of course, you're not here to hear about my cats. You're here to hear about the Fed, interest rates, where the market's going this week, next month, and into 2024, and the best decisions you can make to maximize the money-making opportunity. That is the glorious place of Wall Street. So let's dive straight into that. I will share my screen with you to walk you through facts, data. You can make your own assessment. I'll tell you what I think of it from my perspective as, you know, former um, banker, now cat maltreater, apparently. I'm sorry about that. She seems to be forgiving me, though. Um, are you? I hope so. There we go. Now, probably onto the mouse pad, which is the punishment. Now, before you do anything, I want to encourage you in 24 hours to join me and this cat uh, to learn how we trade and make money consistently in less than an hour a day, potentially make enough money to escape your rat race, your nine to five, whatever your demons are. All you got to do is go to felixfranz.org slash webinar and save your seat because seats will go. There we go. Felixfranz.org slash webinar. Now, let's move on then. And the cats are now sitting in front of the screen, which is terribly helpful. Tallulah. Um, so, you might have seen this, but just to put a bit of perspective where we are right now, we've had the last, this November, the November gains here are the biggest we've had, almost the biggest we've had since 1928. It's happened eight times, I think, two, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight times since 1928 this kind of a November. So it's pretty unusual. So this is a, it's, it's been a bull run and a half. Now, what does that mean? Well, have a look at what that means. And this is actually a screenshot from our newsletter. If you want to get your pause on that, links down below, felixfriends.org slash sub. And QRA, that's the Fed announcing, or not the Fed, the US government announcing how much money they're going to waste. Sorry, how much debt they're going to issue. Sort of the same thing. And when they did that up here, uh, this is a week's chart in August. They scared the bejesus out of us because they were spending way more than we thought. And then in the one just now we had in, they kind of said it's not going to be quite as bad. It was sort of a, you know, they really scared us on the first one and they scared us a little less on the second one. And that's basically what's moved the market. And the market continues to be driven by debt at this point, debt and options pretty much very little else. Now, there is some good news out here. And then we get into the more practical step of how we can implement this. But you need to understand a little bit the background to this. Now, the best way to obviously understand this material is to simply hit the like button. But um, that was a cheap shot, wasn't it? Anyway, I thought I'd try. So where are we with inflation? So the, the white sort of top lines here is the peak of the cycle. This is the US here. And where we are right now with that solid blue line is, is where we are right now. So you can see inflation across the board everywhere has come down a lot. Um, it's come down particularly aggressively with the early hikers. So the countries that really went for it, like your Hungary and, and your, you know, Chile and places like that. Uh, but yeah, US also looking sort of on the right path, right? So that's all, all good so far. So will rates therefore be cut? Well, I think it's a very, very, very high chance that this July hike we had, the last one we had, was the last surprise hike we were going to get. And for reasons we're going to get through, we should be expecting rate cuts. Now, on average, it takes the Fed eight months from last hike to cut. So the economy normally falls apart in those eight months, which is why they start doing it. Around month six or seven after the first rate cut, everyone starts to feel a little bit, unemployment goes up, uh, and the economy starts to sort of, you know, just a one wheel falls off and nothing really to worry about. And then another wheel comes off and then the windscreen wipers and then the windscreen. And then, you know, uh, you kind of start to think, maybe we should just put our foot on the brake a little bit here. That's the average. So when would that mean? That would therefore mean eight months from July would take us to March 
2024. Cat sitting on the mouse pad, as you could just see. Anyway, she's, you're right. I think you're right. Doesn't seem to be in any pain, which is the main thing. So I got, got a cat trapped at the door if you just joined, um, which was not intentional. So the, the crikey, what just happened? Okay, all my screens just went out. Okay, cats are dangerous, dangerous creatures. So I'm glad we're still here because there's literally a power button that she almost just pressed. So please don't do that. Uh, so what are... Um, what are, I'm just reading the comments here. You guys are funny. Um, what are the banks saying? So Goldman Sachs, in their infinite wisdom and insider knowledge, are saying the Fed is going to dictate the global cycle. So how the market's going to evolve in the US and worldwide is going to be taken by the Fed. And we need unemployment to go up about half a percent. And they're expecting the PCE, which is inflation, numbers to be coming around two and a half percent on a year on year basis. Now, given that two percent is the target and it's sort of a bit of a faux half ass target anyway, um, that would give them the leverage to say, we're going in the right direction, unemployment's gone up, therefore we're going to start cutting. The other thing that'll help is just global slowdown. If you look at European data, it's pretty bad. Uh, German recession seems almost assured. I don't know if you have followed that story. I'm, I'm German originally. Um, well, you never shake the, the, the infestation of that. So, um, so I'm just German. That would be, be, be more honest, right? Rather than originally. Um, and the Supreme Court in Germany has basically declared um, most government spending as unconstitutional. Uh, and that's because they're running the same shambles everyone else is running. So I think their, their federal budget is something like 400 billion and euros. And then they have an off budget, <laughs> side budget, which they sort of shove into government-owned banks and institutions and so on, uh, and that is 800 billion. Um, and the, uh, the uh, well, the institutional court rather wisely said that's actually unconstitutional. So they've basically got to cut spending pretty significantly unless they find some loophole, which the court seems to have closed. So got to love the, love the lawyers. And therefore, that in itself would probably tip the country into recession. Biggest economy in Europe, rest of Europe will basically follow. So that'll help. That'll actually help the U.S. stock market. And it's a weird way of looking at it, but it'll actually help the U.S. stock market. Now, um, and Richard, I see your questions. Okay, we'll, get, we'll go through those questions in a second, um, particularly if you smash the like button and tell me. Now, I just want to get you a little bit more perspective of where we are so you can make better decisions here. And this is retail inflow. Again, screenshot from our newsletter. So subscribe to the bloody thing. It's brilliant. Retail inflow is the highest it's been since first quarter of 2022. And that means last week, about $5 billion of retail money bought stocks. It's quite a lot. It's really a lot. Now, the last time that happened was... When? It was here. Right. What happened afterwards? Actually, sorry, it was here. We went up 9%. And then straight afterwards, <laughs> we went down 12%. So the market is a, is a funny thing, isn't it? Um, you get a fake out and then you come crashing back down. So just a bit of a word of warning there that when retail goes all in, that's usually the time when markets start to flip-flop. Now, Retail investors also, there's something called AAII, which is the American Association of Individual Investors, I think is the horrible acronym. And this basically shows you how bullish they are and bullish they really are. And again, we last time we were this bullish was sort of July-ish, July, just before August of this year. And August, I suppose. And what happened then? Well, it was here. That's when they were most bullish. 
It was the very, very top of the market. And then we went down minus 11%. And then, yes, we did recover. So these indicators can be useful in telling you maybe this isn't the moment to go all in because everybody else is. So we're going to look at what are the better options? What's the better thing to do right now? And I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through that. So uh, cat's still looking a little sad. All right. A little bit miffed with me, I think. Um, so this is really what it's all about. This is the big seven, the Microsoft, the Amazons, the Metas, the Apples, the NVIDIAs, the Teslas and the Googles. I thought we forgot somebody. Um, no child left behind, no stock left behind, you know. And we are literally testing the previous peak here, right at it. You have to ask yourself, is that the moment you buy these stocks when they are at an all time high? And I'm not saying they might not go higher. It's just that, is this the moment to go, let's chuck some real money at, you know, Nvidia or Tesla or, or, or whatever it is. So a bit of a word of caution there. Now, really for these guys to keep going up and their earnings are staggering and they are much, much better stocks than the rest of the S&P. Completely agree with that. They're about twice as profitable. So they deserve to be worth more. And most of the S&P is a lot of junk. But for this party to keep going, we need the rate cuts. So at the moment, the market has about a 40% expectation of a March 2024 cut. What does that also mean is if you don't get it, you get you get a kick in the teeth. But you got to watch that number and I'll keep updating you with this every week so you know what the expectation is and when it's meant to, meant, meant to come, right? Now, what do we do now? And um, I like some of your questions here, like Richard Stockdale, for example. I definitely want to touch upon that in a second here. Um, Petra says, Shakespeare's Henry VIII. Um, I don't know what that reference is, but it's random. Uh, what do we do now? Now, the first thing, of course, is come and join me tomorrow in 24 hours live and learn how we can make money in all market situations. And we did a live session yesterday with you guys in the program on that. So come and join me tomorrow and I'll teach you how you can make an income, literally anybody. You need a little bit of capital. That's true. And a willingness to learn one simple strategy and implement it. You can automate it. Don't need to watch the trades. Don't need to stare at charts. You can have a full-time job or whatever else you, you do. All you got to do is hop over to felixwenzelog slash webinar and save your seat. So what's the smarter way to profit from this? Well, what is definitely true is that volatility is super, super low. And I know most people don't understand volatility. And yeah, it's popping up a bit today, but it's still super, super low. And what that means is that Options are very, very, very cheap, whereas stocks have all the risk and none of the advantage. So if you wanted to be bullish, say, QQQ, the NASDAQ, because you like tech stocks, first thing I would do is head over to Options Watch, grab yourself a free 30-day account. It's a platform we developed. I, I never endorse other people's products because I don't know what the hell they do. Um, and the whole intention with this app is just to make it to give you the best data, you get real-time data, um, to give you the easiest and most visual and simple way of understanding how Wall Street trades and the kind of things that Wall Street looks at as an institutional-grade investment tools. So that's really why we, we, we are building this, and I'm super excited to, with all the features that are coming up here. And some of the things you can see here are, where is the resistance? So we're trading at $389. And you can see the major resistance is at $400, which is that little green line there. And there are a bunch of videos here in here as well, which will explain all these little functions and features. And I'll send you some emails when you send, sign up to that so you understand exactly what's going on. But say you don't want to gamble 50-50 on QQQ going up or down. You could set up a trade like this one here. It's not, not a financial advice, obviously. That has an 80% chance of making money. And you might be thinking, how the heck do you do that? Well, you set your trade up where the gray line is here, so well below the market. And you can only do that with options. Now, I probably wouldn't use this strategy because this strategy benefits from falling volatility. So we could do it with 
a bull cold spread instead. And we'd be moving this down to, let's see how much, uh, somewhere like that. Um, maybe you can go a little lower, go to 360. Fidgeting around with this, hey? Um, something like that. Something like that. So 82% chance of profit, potentially make a 12% return. It's a 82% chance, actually. It's a fairly safe setup. And at 373, of course, there's risk with everything. Uh, 373 is our break-even price. So we could literally drop $16 on the NASDAQ, on the QQQ, and we'd still potentially be making money. So that's the sort of thing that I would look at here is a play on volatility. This trade would benefit from rising volatility and a big, big, big room for, 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 for uh, error. And if this makes no sense to you, makes com completely fine, makes very little sense to anybody who hasn't, this hasn't been explained to, come and join me tomorrow. So, seriously, felixfrenz.org slash webinar, and I'll explain that to you. Now, you might see the top of a cat's head here, which is terribly helpful, right? Can you see that? <laughs> this one here. I'm allowing her to sit here because I squashed her in the door to my study. Um, which wasn't very nice. So she made a horrible little squeaking sound. Are you okay? I think so. Okay, on the lap is probably better because that way you're not going to press any buttons. So that's the sort of thing I would do. Now, essentially, in short, what I would say is the smarter way is to essentially buy options, buy call options or call debit spreads. If you don't know what they mean, well, take this opportunity to learn so that in the next round this happens, you are you're equipped. Um, I wouldn't really be buying tech stocks right now, and I know they might go a little higher, but it's just from a risk reward setup, it just doesn't seem to be the place to be when you've just had one of the biggest rallies ever in November since 1928, and you know we're up massively on everything. We're at the very resistance lines for pretty much all stocks. Um, would I short it? No. Don't short it because it's too early. You don't know whether it's going to run, run a bit further. You need something to start cracking and breaking. And then you could possibly do some sort of smarter short trade. Don't just buy, sell a stock or don't just buy some leveraged short ETF. That's total madness. So um. That's essentially what I want to run through on this front here. Of course, I want to take all your questions and we will do that. And we can also have a quick look at the pre-market here, which is not looking wonderful, but also not terrible. So retail looks pretty good because of headlines like this. Black Friday shoppers set online spending record way above estimates. Um, Adobe says 7.5% more online spend and... 9% apparently, according to Salesforce, they all have slightly different data. Shopify, I think, said 22% global e-commerce increases. Uh, everybody obviously has slightly different data, but yeah, it looks pretty good. And people are buying electronics, TVs, all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of good because we haven't really seen that since the pandemic end. So that's very helpful and therefore very, very helpful for the, the big retailers like, like Amazon and so on. Walmart only moderately up. Tesla looking good, but big tech, and that's really what makes the market here, right? These guys is looking just a little bit cautious. Good time to buy puts, Ezekiel. They're very cheap. Yes, I think it's a good time to buy puts. The trouble is, in the last week, retail bought something like $8 billion, uh, sold something like $8 billion of S&P puts. Again, it's it's in the newsletter, like, like check it out. Um, and, and that's a that's scary. Why is that scary? Because if the market does drop, all of those positions need to be closed and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause some serious pain there and it's going to exacerbate any, any southward uh, move. Um, Adu, a thing of selling to an NVIDIA, buying it back at 400, 420. Like, I, I unfortunately can't give you a straight answer to that because that would be financial advice and you're not allowed to do that. But what I always say is write down what your goals are with stocks. When are you going to sell? Maybe set that trade up right at the beginning when you enter the trade. And um, 
you got to map that stuff out so that when you're in the trade, you're not like, what should I do this? Should I do that? It's kind of becomes this emotional decision. So you like specify the criteria for holding the stock or the criteria for selling the stock for profit or for loss. That's, I think, the most important thing to do. Um, but yeah, the moment, from my point of view, not financial advice, NVIDIA looks to be struggling a little bit up here. We've had, zoom in a bit on this. We've had here one, two, three, four peaks and, and, and we're going south again. So it's not it's not exactly a bullish setup, at least from a chart point of view. It's also not terrible. I mean, earnings were good, but guidance was a little slightly, just ever so slightly disappointing, perhaps, for some. Still staggering. I mean, mind-blowing in, in many ways. But, you know, are we going to retest here these, these lows at sort of 411, 4, 4 or something, right? Possible. Possible. Seems to trade in that kind of zigzag fashion. So I, I can see where your thoughts are coming from. Um, righty here. Let me just walk through the questions here. If you, if you, um, if you um, have any questions that I missed, just just re repeat it. Danza said, "Like your cat's bones when you shut them at the door." Um, yeah, no, I think she was okay. The door it closes very slowly. I think it was probably more like she's scared of it, but it does have one of those closing mechanisms on it. Um, which isn't brilliant, but not like a really strong one, but I'm feeling her spine and stuff on my, my lap. She seems okay. She's not making any squeaking noises. She's just a bit upset with me. Um, I should have I should have known. Um, Richard saying, you have shown previously that for every 1% rate increase, growth stocks lose 10%. Does it work the other way around? Yes, it works exactly the other way around. So you would expect your most rate sensitive beasts, your non profitable tech, your, you know, your arc type things to benefit dramatically. And I don't mean just arc, but all stocks like that. And I'll show you. Let's pop in here US interest rates. And let's turn them upside down. You're turning me in upside down interest rates. And we started raising rates. Oh, hang on. Sort of get the idea. Well, it's, you know, charts never fit perfectly, but let's get rid of all the drawings. This is in orange, inverted interest rates. So what you can see is as rates went up, I know they should, you know, the, all those stocks tanked. And now that they are flattening out, they're starting to somewhat recover, right? So yes, there is there is that correlation. And I don't know how much ARC went down by from when rates when rates started to expect it to get cut. Sort of uh, sorry, started to go up by they're down 64%. Rates went up five percent. It's kind of close, right? And then you know, a lot of the stuff that ARC owned was a pile of shite. So there is an element of that in there and it was overvalued. So there's always a bit bit more um, movement. But yeah, you would expect high risk tech stocks, in a sense, to be the easy trade if rates go down, right? It should go up very significantly. What are your thoughts on on wheeling stocks, Frederick, not a big fan, not a big fan of wheeling, to be honest with you. I just think most of the time it's not admitting a loss <laughs> and just uh, doing the same thing again and, and that sort of insanity. But there can, of course, be moments when it is a good idea. But um, um, oh, sorry, a wheeling. Oh, I thought you meant rolling. Wheeling. Um, yeah, not huge fan. I think it's very capital intensive. So I don't really get it. It's I get selling. Okay, selling a covered call is an exit strategy. Uh, that makes sense. But to just keep doing it for on your portfolio, in high IV, in high volatility moments, it works. Like right now, volatility is super low, like four-year low. So it makes absolutely zero sense whatsoever to do it. You're just not going to get enough premium for it. Um, the only time I would sell covered calls is either if I want to exit the position or if I want to raise some money to buy a put. 
to hedge the position. That's kind of kind of the more the trade I look at. But it's a great place to start. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just you you'll never find a hedge fund do it or a Wall Street trader or a bank do it. It's just it's a kind of made for retail strategy because it's quite simple. Um, so, but if you understand that, it's very e- it's a very easy step for you up to to become a uh, a trader who just makes money on the trade rather than owning the stock. Like I don't trade, but I own the stock on because that would just tie up a lot of capital. Uh, Rivians, I I'm cautious on all these. You know, what's the valuation on this? Still 15 billion, right? It's still, still quite a lot, isn't it? So I, I, I'm a bit cautious on these guys. I also don't particularly love management or product uh, or can't really tell, like, what is that special about them. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure they've got the, they've got what it takes, in a sense, to really survive this. I think that's honestly my, 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 my concern with this. You, you need to have a real brand identity, something that's really different, a product that really has a cult following. I, I don't know if Rivian has that. I, I've, not, I've not, wit- not witnessed it, but it, I might well be wrong on that. Um, looking forward to a vicious week ahead. Isolette's asking about NEO. I was saying I wasn't expecting a huge amount. Generally, earnings tr- calls for car companies are not massive catalysts. Why? Because you know how many cars they've already sold. So you know the revenue. You have a fairly good idea of their margin numbers. So it really is mostly about guidance for next quarter and guidance for margin. Now. Neo's issue a little bit is that they have overpromised and underdelivered for about a year, year and a half. Um, and that therefore means that we take their guidance with a pinch of salt, we, the market. So even if they say margins are, you know, margins, they did indicate that gross margins, I think, would return to double digits at 10% plus. So if they come in at 11%, everyone's going to be going, okay, great. They delivered on what they said they would, probably. And if they then guide up, we're probably going to go, well, let's wait and see till they prove that is, is, is true. So I'm not a neo bear in any way, shape, or form. It's just when a stock's like underperformed as long as this has, and yes, definitely by far the best quarter. I don't want to downplay that. But we were expecting that quarter a couple of quarters ago, right? And supply chain and COVID and lots of things have gotten in the way. So they are on their back foot that they have to over deliver consistently to kind of get us there. Now, there is an article out about how they're planning on cutting, I don't know, 70% 70% of labor force or something and replacing them with robots and all that kind of stuff. And that's all very well. And that's nice. And in a boom market, in a bullish EV market, that would have done wonders for the stock. But in this kind of slight EV bear market, everyone's just going, so what? Don't care. Show me the numbers well, after you've done it, not before. So I think they just have to yeah, they're in a slightly tough spot. They have to perform. Market just opened, by the way, and Neo down 1.2%. So, yeah, if you have any more questions, feel free to pop them out there. Farouk, if this stock price is above the resistance in the highest call, yeah, no, then, you're, then you've beaten the resistance, Farouk. It's not really much resistance at that point. Bad dog bikes, will you always get assigned if you hold it till expiration? Yes. So don't do it. Get out of the trade earlier. You don't want to be holding options positions in the last couple of days of a trade. Don't do it. It's just not worth it. It becomes very, very risky, very, very volatile. And assignment risk is a real thing. So don't, don't do it. You want longer term trades. Get out of the thing, set up another new trade that's 45 days long. Get out of that thing before 21 days to expiration. 
NVDA up, the rumor mill says. Let's have a look here. Well, 0.2%. Uh, but yes, just a teeny tiny bit. Uh, you think we're going to touch the on the SPX, the 4,600? I think it's possible. So there is a lot of what's called gamma, which I'm going to lose about half the um, <laughs> uh, half the audience now. But let me show you today's newsletter. Uh, I should be logged into this, shouldn't I? Just sign into this. How do we sign into this? Check your email. Brilliant. Now, I want to show you this because we put out a newsletter today where we really walk through this. And uh, I think it's a really, really, really important concept to understand that 99% of people don't understand. And that means they miss out on some really key data here. So here we go. Uh, this is today's newsletter. It's on Substack. Uh, felixfrenzorg slash sub is the link down below. And this is written by a former market maker, 20 years institutional trading experience. Brilliant man, Elliot. Super, super kind. And he's basically saying, look, there is about $56 billion of gamma out there. And what does that mean? It means when the stocks go up, the dealers, the market makers, and Elliot used to be one of those, they are forced to sell stocks. How does that work? Basically, all those call options that are sitting there starting to make money. And on the other side of the call option trade is a, is a dealer, and he owns stock to hedge his options position. And we don't need to go into the details of that, but he's basically forced to sell. So on the way up, we're being slowed down by exactly this here. And it's a great thing to understand. And it's a, it's a little technical, I get that, but it's, it's very, very important. And that's why we keep sharing it. Mantis, like button smashed. Man after my own heart. Thank you very much, Mantis. I appreciate that. So yeah, this is kind of important. And then the next thing is that when, when we go down, what happens is people start buying put options to like hedge their position and that actually makes the market worse. So I'm not a doomer or gloomer, but um, I, you know, I'm just saying we are, we are at very, very high levels here. So the 4,600 is going to be a tough nut to crack, I, I would say here. Um, Knowledge Seeker, thank you very much for that. Drops Groove says SoFi. A video coming out on SoFi today. Uh, you guys might have already seen it. Preview out there. And what I don't like about this is that the last low was lower than the previous two. That's really not good. Uh, so we... Also, you know, that high, number one, the second high was lower than the first one. The third high was lower than the second one. So you, you kind of get this southerly pattern uh, that isn't, isn't really what we want. So at the moment, the stock is just tanking. Um, they could really do with interest rate cuts. <laughs> that would really help a lot. Uh, but really, they need to break through about 750 to really turn this around. Uh, in that video today, I also run you through a potential trade, which I think from memory was something like this. So if you, again, not a recommendation, but again, SoFi, volatility is very low, which means options are very cheap. So you don't want to be selling options. And this is on optionswatch.io. There's a link in the description. You can just sign up to a free account for like 30 days and trial this. So say we go into maybe January. It's a bit long, isn't it? But we'll try it. Um, so if you want to be buying options, a debit spread is a good instrument for that. And then you can go something like that, where you are positioned at 580. So you are more than a dollar ten below the market. That gray line here is your break even line. So you can see we haven't touched that for six months. So it's a you've got that safety buffer here, and that's what gives you a 76% chance of profit, right? And you know, play around with this and 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 learn more. And there's also some videos up there and so on. And we're working to make this better every week. So uh, check it out.
Palantir crashing? 2.5% down. Hmm. I wonder where the support sits. Should we look that up? So again, you can go to Options Watch, type in Palantir, click on it. You know, make yourself up. Oh, actually, that's why um that's what I actually wanted to get before the, the whole cat saga happened. Pot of tea. Nothing better than a good cup of Earl Grey. I was going to say English, but it's actually from Sri Lanka, isn't it? So okay, here's Palantir. So if we go into end of the month, what can you see? What does it show you? You see these red and green lines? The red lines is where the put options are. That's your support. And the green lines are your resistance where the call options sit. So $20 is your resistance on the way up. And 18 is your support which sort of makes sense. It kind of sits around the recent low here. And you can also go out into January and have a look at that and just sort of add those together in your mind. And not a lot of hedging there actually going on for, or not a lot of puts really for, for Jan. So still $20 is the resistance, but nothing in between. So $18 is basically your support line here. So we can move this up here to 18, and then now we know, actually, we can use the green line. I normally use green lines for support and red lines for resistance. So the core wall has also moved down from 21 to now just 20, so which isn't brilliant, right? So the market's coming down a bit here, so just taking a bit of exuberance off there then. Any other questions? Pop them into the chat. If you haven't already, make sure you sign up for live trading training tomorrow. FelixFriends.org slash webinar um, in literally 24 hours. Uh, so save your seat before somebody else sits on it. So anything else big out today? Uh, Black Friday data looks very good. So probably good for retailers. There's a big story out on, on Neo. In the in the Hong Kong press here, is saying they're going to cut their workforce by another thirty percent by twenty twenty seven. That's quite a long way out. So I don't think the market's going to pay that much attention. But essentially, they want to fully automate their production lines, get rid of a ton of management, and so on, which is all very very good. And it's just, is it bullish? Well, I think it just shows also how competitive manufacturing is going to get in this space. So they kind of need to do it. x is talking about something similar. So you're going to see some really futuristic um, plants with basically nobody in it, just a bunch of robots, which is maybe the future of the world. Um, what was your question, Reems? Did I miss your question? Repeat it, would you? I try not to intentionally skip questions. I do occasionally intentionally skip questions, but I didn't see yours, Reams. Uh, post it again, and, and, and I'll look at it. Andrea, PayPal, gladly look at that. It's, oh, wow. It's actually above the 50-day moving average line, which is that yellow line here. And that's quite positive, but really, you want to exceed the previous peak. I would argue the previous peak sits up here, 58 and a bit, about 58.50. So we still have about another two dollars to go before this technically becomes something more, more bullish. And I don't think there is any news out there. I think it's just possibly online spending, Black Friday, and so on. And today is Cyber Monday, I'm told, which sounds like something from the 80s. Um, Reams has given up, not asking the question. Touching the seven dollar wall. Says so far. Says, yeah, making out with the seven dollar, right? Where was the resistance on so far? Have a look here. So, what are we looking at? Well, for this week, seven dollars is your resistance, that green line there. And for the month, you can also look at that. Clearly, seven dollars. So, seven dollars is basically the resistance, and that's the line we've been been, uh, you know, making sweet love to for the last month or so. So yeah, seven bucks is the one to break. It's a little challenging to break that clearly, but you need to do that and you need to go back up to 750 for this to become 
a bit of a technical rally here. So yeah, seven dollar wall is a is a real thing. I want to thank you tremendously for tuning in. Um, I want to assure you that the uh, cat that I squashed in my door is all right, even though she's looking a little bit miffed with me. But you seem to be okay, don't you? So chief financial analyst here. Without her, there'd be no channel, right? There'd be no thoughts. There'd be no videos. And that'd be a tragedy, wouldn't it? So uh, there we are. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, so far, video coming out later. Make sure you get your pause on the 30-day free trial of Options Watch. I know it seems a little abstract at first, but it's honestly worth learning. It's a great resource. Come and join me tomorrow at, on the webinar at felixrenzelog slash webinar and see you tomorrow.